Jure, welcome to the show. We're going to today talk a little bit about the blockchain and all that kind of jazz. Uh, do you want to give us a kind of a background on how you got so interested in the scene in the first place? Yeah, so I'm a tech worker in the Pacific Northwest, and I've always been interested in cryptography, and I used to be a like heavy techno-solutionist, techno-optimist sort of person until I got some better politics. But the thing about cryptography and privacy has always been super interesting to me. And when I saw the original Bitcoin stuff when it was first coming out back in 2009, I started following it, and I realized that it was just bad. So I've kept following it. I never invested. I never had a Bitcoin. But I kept following what's going on throughout the entire history of it. And so I understand it from a deep technical level what is going on there. So there's a number of kind of innovations, I suppose. Well, well, I don't want to go so far as to say that. Well, okay, let me ask the question. What innovations, what kind of cryptographic innovations were in the original Bitcoin paper? So amusingly, there aren't actually many. All the stuff from the Bitcoin paper is actually recombining a bunch of existing known technologies into a set of combinations that was like just lying around, just nobody decided to put it together. The proof of work stuff had been decided around many years ago as a solution to email spam and a problem called hash cash. Merkle trees were something that had been used in Git already for several years. And the idea of using chained hashes to create immutable ledger was already something that also existed in the literature. It just nobody had put it together and nobody had written an actual implementation that was useful for other people. So like it's a, it's the iPhone, essentially, you know, people when they say, well, Steve Jobs, you know, invented iPhone, you know, all those technologies existed. Right. But the, the kind of genius of it is to put it together in a usable kind of way with with an actual use function. Right. So can we dig into some of those elements you were talking about? Do you want to talk about what proof of work is? Yeah, so proof of work is what people will generally talk about as why you can't buy a video card right now, why it's such an environmental disaster for Bitcoin to exist. It is making computers do computational work that is fundamentally difficult to do linearly. That's sort of the whole idea behind it. To sort of explain it a bit, it's best to sort of think of the original implementation of it, which is this project called Hashcash that existed for several years before Bitcoin, which was the idea was you would want to reduce the amount of spam. And so what you would ask people who sent you email to do is to compute a hard computing problem before sending you an email message. And the idea was that for people who were sending messages to each other, it might add one to two seconds for you to send an email. But if you're trying to spam millions of people, if you add one to two seconds per email to calculate this hard computer problem, now you just have a problem where you just don't have the computing power to do that anymore. And so that was, the, that was like a solution that was come up with to try and solve that problem. It never got fully implemented anywhere, but that idea was already out there. Right. So this is like one of these things where you, I think it's like a factorization of a, of a large number, isn't it? it? So to be more technical, it's you try and calculate a string that has given a certain string. You try and find a suffix to that string where the hash of that string using a cryptographic hash begins with a certain number of bits set to zero. And so since a hash function is, to explain for those that are not as familiar with this, a hash function is something that is very easy to once you have a piece of data, you can calculate the hash easily. But if you give a hash, you can't figure out what it came from. And so this is also known as a one-way function. And so the only way to discover a hash that has a certain number of zeros in front of it is to just try random strength. But because of the properties where it, the hash is random, by setting how many zeros in front, you can sort of estimate how many random strings you have to try before you get that particular thing and that can set your difficulty of like on a computer of this capacity it'll take about a minute for them to calculate that sort of value cool so it's like like the way i always think of it as a maths dude is like you know it's like trying to find the factors of a very large number say if you get two large primes multiply them and then somebody has a has this very large number and they haven't seen the two primes that were multiplied to get it and they have to 
try and find those two primes that they have to do the only real way there's some obviously there are some techniques but it it ends up it largely being a a work of brute force but once you have yeah once you have your primes you know it's totally easy to do you know to get the to multiply them against each other to get the big number but to get the big number to get the two primes from the big number is fucking extremely hard so it's essentially that type of a problem right yeah that that problem is used for a different branch of cryptography the hashing stuff doesn't require like any deep math it's just like certain bit manipulations that you have to do that we've also proven that are hard to do the opposite direction. Exactly. So what the Merkle tree stuff then? Where does that come in? So to explain what a Merkle tree is, it is a way of doing a data structure across data that makes it so that you can find parts of a, of a list by traversing a tree through hash functions. So this hash function pro- concept comes up a bunch, which is that you can create a reference to a root and then you make derivatives of it by hashing some new data in with the root and then you can hash that data in with the root and this is the way that the whole bitcoin chain is actually built but it's actually also the same thing as git where git also uses these hash functions git is a source control system it also uses these hash functions to connect commits to one another it's the exact same technology yeah, that's right. So, like, you know, I've just literally been using Git for some of my programming work there. I just close it down. And when you do, like, an update, so Git is this, for people who don't do programming, it's a it's a place where you kind of store versions of your, it's version control for your computer code, essentially. And when you, like, you know, you do a commit to or a merge or whatever, it'll have this long hash sequence of A, B, um, 1, 9, 7, 3, 4, 1, exclamation mark, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it does that each time when you upload a new version and there's some kind of hashing going on there. Do I have that kind of yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing about it is that because the hashes are unique, you can use that to traverse the entire structure without having to, like, have the links explicit is sort of the sort of interesting bit about it, is that because the next hash is dependent upon the previous one, you can figure out those two things are linked without having the links as explicit in your system. Okay, so do you want to give us then, say, the overall way Bitcoin then, say, operates for people who don't know? So the way that Bitcoin works, in short, is that there is a ledger that is trying to be maintained. That is all Bitcoin end is at the end of the day is a ledger, which is a series of transactions being put into it. The blocks in blockchain from Bitcoin is this block consists of N transactions and that you are committing that these set of N transactions are done. The proof of work comes in in that there is a pool of transactions that people would like to have on the blockchain that is just kept in uh, memory by all the various clients. The various miners take a list of those transactions and then do that thing with the whole hash cache idea of you try and find a string that given that list of transactions plus some random value comes out to a hash that has a certain number of zeros in the front of it. And that's what the miners are doing all the time, is just taking a random string, trying to see if it has the right number of zeros in front of it, and then outputs that to the system uh, and, and pick that out. If you do, the benefit that you get is that you get to write at the end of the block that your account gets 50 bitcoins. That's, that's the whole mining, why people mine, is that you actually are not looking for a block of exactly that set of transactions. You're looking for a block that has exactly that set of transactions plus a bonus for yourself. And then you get to write that list into the to the immutable ledger. And then that is sent out to everybody that, hey, I won the lottery of finding that value. And then once you saw, hand the value in, then everyone agrees that, hey, I can verify that this person did find the solution. They did play by the rules. And then the last bit is that the longest chain becomes the one that everyone works on. So for example, there is the pathological case of two different miners coming up with the exact same random string at the exact same time, and they both say, hey, I won this 50 bitcoins, and then you have to decide who wins, and the software just decides to pick whoever came up with like the lowest number 
and then they uh, everyone will work off of that chain rather than the other one. Do people always work off that longest chain? Like, is that just in the programming of Bitcoin itself? Well, that's how you get into things like forks and hard forks and stuff like that, which is the, the longest chain is a concept defined by the software to say what is the group of blocks we're going to look at. Okay, so let's let's get there. Let's get into that a little bit. So the the say we'll we'll deal with this with Bitcoin. The Bitcoin white papers went out. Some people implemented it and they programmed it up, put it up onto GitHub. People can download it and run it on their machine. That's the general gist, right? And in fact, part of the reason that Bitcoin did take off is that the original paper writer also is the person who implemented the first version of the code. Okay, so. Where sits this ledger then that when you I download this and I run it, where how do I know where to go to get like the ledger? So this is where some of the peer-to-peer technology that like fell out of favor after the end of the piracy era was brought back into vogue by this stuff. There is a idea called a distributed hash table, which again has been around like GNUnet was an initial implementation of this many years ago. And it was done as a file sharing software at the time. But this distributed hash table is a way for a number of computers to all have pieces of the entire system without any one of them being dependent on for the entire list of things. And it's just a way where you can say, hey, I would like to find the value that has hash you blah. And then you do a gossip through the entire network where you just like ask the people who are near you, hey, do you know where blah is? And if they don't know where blah is, they'll ask the people that are close to them. And close in this term is just like a concept that involves like every node has an address and the addresses like make a virtual network and you use that to figure out how to traverse the network. And it's super complicated technical stuff. But the idea is that the entire ledger is kept across all the machines because all of them are asking for all of it all the time. And so they can just continue to distribute it between all of them. So becoming a node on the Bitcoin network actually also requires quite a bit of storage capacity to store all of it. And many people do not actually store the entire blockchain on their machine. There's just a large number of high value places that are storing the entire ledger themselves that other people can ask for. How big is the ledger at this stage? I believe it is in terabytes at this point. Same thing for Ethereum and all the rest of it. And they are growing constantly. Okay, so let's, I suppose we should talk about the blocks as well. Like what limitations are there for the blocks? Like how big are these blocks? How many transactions? What does that mean for the, for it as a currency? So this is one of the bigger problems that has come up and is, like what Ethereum was meant to solve on top of Bitcoin, the number of transactions that you can put inside of a block is relatively small for for Bitcoin, especially. There's actually, this has caused numerous forks of the system because people have tried to find different solutions, but the scarcity doesn't work. Now, remember earlier when I was mentioning that there's just this pool, again, distributed by that same distributed hash table of, this is transactions I would like to have on the network, on the ledger eventually, you know, here's what you do. One of the things you can do when you add that transaction is you can say, hey, I'm also willing to pay to whoever is willing to mine my transaction an additional fee that they get to pocket alongside the mining fee. And so as rational economic actors, all of the miners just take the list of every transaction, sort it by who is willing to pay the most for that transaction to happen, and then use that as the list that fits into the block. So what... What type of a transaction fee are we talking about here? Depends upon the blockchain and everything else. Like, Ethereum has gotten a lot of the more news recently, and that you'll hear it referred to as gas fees over there. But right now, it takes about somewhere between $50 to $150 usually to get something on the chain. Wow, so that's that's a hell of a transaction fee. Yes. (laughs) So most people who are interacting with the blockchain are not actually interacting with the blockchain just because it'd be too expensive to do so. So, like, I saw a clip of some unnamed Bitcoin bro at some, uh, I think it was on it was on Twitter, somebody at, like, a bar at some event, and he basically paid for his beer with Bitcoin app on his phone. Like, what's going on there? That can't, he can't be literally buying a beer over Bitcoin, can he? 
<laughs> yes, yes, given that it costs so much to run a transaction. And as a note, because of that problem I added earlier, where you have these two different chains that could possibly arise if two different miners come up with the same thing, you technically are need to wait for so many blocks to go by to realize which chain is going to become the longer one by consensus. And the blocks only happen every 10 minutes on Bitcoin. So if you make a transaction in block one, you will not have it confirmed until block four, which is 40 minutes later. So you also can't buy a beer that way because no, nobody is going to wait 40 minutes for your check to clear in, in reality. So all that's really happening when someone is like buying a beer with their phone with Bitcoin is that they're using a service like Coinbase and Coinbase is holding in custody a large number of Bitcoins. And then they're having a database entry that says you own X Bitcoins on your Coinbase account. And then those are referencing our large stash of Bitcoins that we are actually holding. And then when you do the transaction, you are just saying, please decrement the number of Bitcoins in my account that are part of the Coinbase holdings and add them to the Coinbase holdings of the person I'm making the transaction with. It's so pathetic. <laughs> it's so fucking pathetic that literally the idea of it being a currency is that you can't. You just have to have a secondary ledger that you trade them on. Yes. It's unbelievably mind-bendingly <laughs> stupid. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Ethereum tries to solve some of the problems, like the blocks only come by every minute, I believe, but that doesn't change the problem too much. Like, again, most people are not willing to wait five minutes for their transaction to complete. Like, you know, can you imagine waiting in the grocery store and being like, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to pay with this. Okay, I have to wait here for five minutes between the end of my transaction and when, you know, we confirm that we actually got your money. It's just, yeah, mind-boggling. You know, if, if we're going to talk about, like, inbuilt like into the actual core architecture of the coin bitcoin itself is this idea of trusting transactions between untrusted people people you don't know and like that the way they solve this cryptographically makes a huge overhead it's like a cost to maintain this trustlessness such is this cost that it requires huge mining and also the transaction blocks are so small and slow to confirm that it, in effect, makes the actual currency itself not a currency, but purely a speculative asset. Yes. <laughs> now, let's talk about some more of these weaknesses. We're not done here yet. Talk about, like, the, the this, you, you call it, was it the D, DOA or DAO kind of scandal? So... One of the things that people especially try to attract people with, with different politics from the general Bitcoin person to this idea is what people call DAOs, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which sounds great in a lot of ways if that were anywhere near what they actually were. Now, the original implementation of this was done by a project called The DAO. This happened in 2016. If you want full details of it, I highly recommend the recent video essay put out by Dan Olson called The Problem with NFTs, and he goes into very good detail of exactly what went wrong. But the short version is that the DAO was a crypto-based venture capital fund that people were investing in. And they decided to implement all of the way that the investing and everything else would work on top of the blockchain, on top of Ethereum in particular. And the idea behind this was that you would put money into this account and in exchange you would get a certain number of voting tokens that you could then use to direct how the money inside of it moved. And that was sort of the what you can actually do with this sort of concept of smart contracts, which are just completely not what they are. That's what you can actually do with the system is you can do this sort of stuff of like make financial traction based upon voting. That's probably about the most complex thing you could actually do. But it turned out that there was a bug, because again, it was still code, that allowed somebody to steal like one third of the money that was put into this venture capital fund. And because the people involved were able to change the code and change the 51% of the people who were running the software, they decided to fork the system and roll back those transactions by changing how the code worked and enough people agreed that 
they moved all over to a new system where that just never happened. So this would mean, is it the the number of people that own the majority of coins, which presumably is probably quite a small number of people, you know, that there's like a, it's like a built-in oligarchy. Yes, exactly. It's exactly what happened. It's an oligarchy of the computer programmers. Yeah, but did it not need also to own the coins or they can just do it themselves? Well, when when they did the hard fork in the code, they just said, Every block between these values, we're just going to pretend didn't happen. So they didn't even, the programmers themselves just decided they didn't actually need to have, say, a majority of Ethereum to do that, say. Well, they, they would eventually need the majority of Ethereum to build on top of their particular chain that decided to ignore that set of it. But because the people who were maintaining the code and oh, there was an actual you know, foundation, there is an organization called the Ethereum Foundation which pays people to maintain the Ethereum code base, there is technically a version of Ethereum that never did that change that people still try to keep up to date called Ethereum Classic, but it's completely worthless effectively because nobody's using it and there's no no backing behind it. So this whole decentralized stuff has got a key core, you know, kind of, yeah, central committee. It's got its own common turn. Yes. (laughs) And it's just a common turn of programmers. Yeah, that's what we're all after, really, isn't it? You know, a nerd common turn, let's be honest. Uh, Here on the Emancipation Network, anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's that's kind of chronic. Yep. So, like, not only is it no good for transactions, you know, the, as, as, a, as a workable currency, it's, it's not even good at being decentralized due to both the, the weakness of the transactions itself because of the transactions are so slow, you you might give it over to somebody like Coinbase, and then you just have a, a node, in, another node that has got huge power. Yep. But you also then have this cabal of programmers who genuinely do maintain and control the actual blockchain itself. Correct. <laughs> and, and again, because it's this 51% thing, like, yes, technically, like, when, when Bitcoin was first starting off, like, there became a point in which it was so easy to create your own coin that you could go to a web page and it would give you a miner customized with whatever parameters you wanted. And it would just give you, here's the version of the Bitcoin software with the following parameters changed. Here's how you set up your own coin. You know, Ethereum now makes this even easier. But that was a very endemic problem. And 95% of those coins just died immediately because no one was able to maintain the code to make it sure that it stayed up to date and everything else. And so the only ones that survive are the ones that have coders working on them constantly. And those coders, of course, need to be paid by somebody in order for them to continue working on it. And so that like leads to these systemic things where even though it is technically decentralized, it is centralized around these foundations that maintain things like the Bitcoin code base, the Ethereum code base, etc. Right. So we have the proof of work. That's the kind of mining. You give them a difficult problem to solve. Therefore, they've shown they've done the work and they get the, the solved hash and they get their transaction added on, they get their coins added, and that allows the transactions to go. But is it Ethereum has a not proof of work, but proof of stake? S- stake. Yeah. Can you explain proof of stake then? So Ethereum has been attempting to migrate to proof of stake for, I think, literally years now. And they have not moved because they cannot get 51% of the miners to agree to move to proof of stake. So again, that's now where you have this other group of people who are the people who take advantage of the fact that they can use capital to purchase video cards, and they want to maintain their ability to use that capital to continue to mine Ethereum and make money that way. So that's, that's, that is a whole other sort of problem on top of the thing there. But even if they did decide to move to proof of stake, it very much goes towards the same problem, which is the idea behind proof of stake is that Proof of work depends upon using computing power to decide who gets to take this random shot at being the person who adds the new transaction that everyone then agrees to. The idea behind proof of stake is instead of using computing power as a proxy for capital, to use capital as a proxy for capital to decide who gets to make the blocks happen. You basically take a stake, a group of tokens, they're called staking tokens, and you say, I'm betting this portion of my stake to that I would like to mine this particular next block coming up. And then 
if you win the bet, because you can do these algorithms that'll let you pick a number between zero and one randomly among a large group of computers without anyone being able to buy the thing, if your stake becomes the one you, that it is, you spend those staking tokens, you can't use them anymore, but then you get to add the next block, and then eventually those staking tokens will refresh, and then you can use them again to buy another block further down the line. So are they getting paid to do the, the addition of the block? Yeah, because they get to take all the transaction fees. Right. But so it's like, it's just basically rewarding a different oligarchy. Yes. And again, you know, the, the computing power already was just a proxy for whoever had the most capital. And now they're just using capital to express who has the most capital. Right. But they could be different capitals. And that's the problem for the miners. Right. Yes. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so uh, it, it again, it's uh, showing much more along the lines of a narco capitalist than a narco communist again. <laughs> yes, very much so. So we have another clique, another common turn over here. Yeah, there's, a, there's a battle between two rival common turns, let's put that. Yes. <laughs> this is some kind of Sino Soviet split going on. Right. Yes. <laughs> so just to put it into context, how many transactions? Do you think Bitcoin is it doing, say, a minute versus, say, Visa or MasterCard? Oh, it, it is. They're off by many, many orders of magnitude. Like, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something along the lines of, like, the number of transactions that Bitcoin has done total does not come anywhere near the number of transactions Visa has done in, in a year. Like, it, it is extremely slow. Visa can do millions of transactions every second. And Ethereum, again, is forced to this fixed number for every 10 minutes. So what, what are the transactions that are going on there like? Is it all uh, money laundering, kitty porn, drug money, you know, bribes? You know, like literally, like what is the use case for it? Bar, bar pure speculative. But like even the people that are speculating are probably a lot of the time people with hot money. Well, yeah. So in the first day of the Bitcoin, about the only thing you could use it for was purchasing drugs on the Silk Road. And so, you know, that was the vast use cases very early on was for things like that. At this point, the vast majority of transactions, from my understanding, are just people moving around the speculative asset as much as they can. There is no actual transactions going on because it's just too expensive to do so. Like the There's literally no, there's literally no transactions going on. Literally no real life purchases, just shifting of large funds. Right. Yeah, because like, you know, you have your different people like your Binance's and your Coinbase's and everyone else who have to maintain a certain number of Bitcoins as their reserve that they're trying to t take, trying to hold on to. Or you have now the president of El Salvador buying Bitcoin for the country, which is, you know, a great, hilarious story all on its own. And then you have, so those are like some number of the things. Uh, one of the other things which links directly to the money laundering is uh, there are these things called mixer networks because, you know, one of the things that is not brought up nearly as often is that as much as people talk about Bitcoin as being, you know, anonymous, it is truly pseudonymous where there is a public key that identifies you on the network. And so you can see every transaction to and from any particular public key on the network and it's stored for eternity. And so one way that people try and deal with this issue is that if they have hot money, is they hand it to these services called mixers, where they just have a huge stash of money that they are just constantly moving in, you know, differing, differing amounts between multiple Bitcoin addresses so that you can put hot money into this, mix it around with some other hot money, and then take out money from it at some point later, and the exact provenance between those two is lost. Right. And I've heard some other scandal, I think, as well, about is there one of these places where they say they're 100% backed by dollars? So it's like a, a, a dollar backed version and that they don't have literally, they don't have anything like they're supposed to have. So this is what is known as the Tether system. And that is a coin on, on the Ethereum blockchain. And again, they promise that for every Tether that you own, that there is a US dollar that you can get in exchange for it. The SEC was very interesting in this, interested in this idea because they were like, you seem to be holding US dollars. We would be interested in how many US dollars you were actually holding. And when they did a look, I think they found maybe 3% of the outstanding tether they had US dollars that they could actually do. They claim 
that they're able to do 100% because they hold enough Bitcoin that those Bitcoins are equivalent to all the dollars that they have. But of course, the value of those Bitcoin is dependent upon the value of the crypto markets, which themselves are dependent upon the value of Tether. So there is no there there. <laughs> Uh, like 3%, yeah, that's pretty small. Like, what is it? Uh, the Basel II Accords for bank uh, reserves was, I think, 5 to 10% liquid assets, you know, put it into comparison. Yep. I think they were before 2008, uh, so I think they've been changed since. Right. So 3% is fucking nothing, man. <laughs> right. That's like the float in a bar. If you were to compare all this right. spirits and beer in the bar and the 200 quid in the till, that's kind of what we're talking about. Right. <laughs> okay, so I was reading something recently. I, it was in a pretty normy thing. I don't know if it was like the FT or Bloomberg or somewhere like that. I think it was some Brazilian economist was giving a very harsh look at the whole Bitcoin type scene. And he was saying that actually Bitcoin these are worse than a Ponzi scheme. I don't know. Did you read this article? <laughs> I I didn't read it, but I can see what, what he is saying because the, the part of the thing with the Ponzi scheme is that in a way, you could possibly go after the person that is running the Ponzi scheme, but there is nothing that you can go after. The fact that the term rug pull is not an uncommon term inside of the various communities around this stuff tells you something, that it's like, oh, this is just something that you just expect to happen, and that someone is going to pull the rug out from underneath you, and that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah, like, he, he was making the case that, like, I think with Bernie Madoff and that, when, you know, when that went bust, like, when people actually did get their money back, you know, they right. got most of it back, that they were able to, like, you know, if he was scamming 5% a year, you know, there was still a big lump of money there and it was able to be distributed and they were able to like sue his estate and people who worked there or whatever for it. But when, if Bitcoin goes bust in the morning, say the price of Bitcoin goes to $1 because the UN has a thing for the climate change and they say no more mining of coins, say, or something. The, the US state says anybody, any state that has Bitcoin, except Bitcoin as a transaction, we'll put like Iranian style uh, sanctions on, right? And the, the price falls out of its arse. That all these people, there's no one to go back to say, oh, can I get my money back? Right. And, and that is, in fact, one of the core features of the network is that Bitcoin does not have any way of reversing a transaction. Period. End of sentence. Yeah, no reverse gear, lads. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, driving along a mountain road with no reverse gear. Yep. <laughs> So is there anything else, is there any other like major, major flaws that we haven't discussed yet with like the kind of way these things are implemented? The, the last sort of thing we sort of brushed against a couple of times is just the concept of smart contracts, which is this idea they keep trying to sell that like we can make a smart contract that represents some idea in the real world and that the people who sign onto the smart contract can then be held to it in a way that does not involve any like fallible judges or the legal system or anything else like that. That's how they try and sell it. What they have really implemented is a way to do functions on the blockchain that are very expensive and can only do financial transactions, which is a very different thing from what they keep trying to sell it as. So they, there's a, they add a little bit of code into the blockchain itself. And when, say, the contract has been initiated or something, it runs some code to do a transaction to somebody. So it, it's even slightly worse than that, because the way you make a program run is you pay money. So the, the only way to make it run is by paying somebody money to make it run. You pay the network. that It's just, it's just another transaction fee. You'll hear a term gas fees in Ethereum, but it is just another transaction fee. The transaction in this case is the entire network, please run this program. And then the entire network runs the program, puts the results on the blockchain, and then does that, uh, and then commits to it because all of them decided to run the program together and do it up. All the NFTs are this thing, all the DAOs are this thing, all of those different things that people are trying to sell. All they're doing is they're just saying, I have to pay money. And any idea that people have that you could like tie this to the real world would entirely have to be based upon the idea that by running this transaction and paying the gas fees now, you will get a return of higher than the gas fees later. Okay, so what type of thing is the code actually doing? It, it is a virtual machine, and it can 
do edits to the blockchain. Like, it can run any amount of, like, code in that point of it, but the end result of it always has to be data from the blockchain to the blockchain. The sort of best examples of this in any sort of way is some people have made, like, uh, games on top of the blockchain, where the actual code for the game is encoded into the blockchain, where it's like, I have a token, and then we can submit our two tokens to a system, and those two tokens can fight each other, and then the output of the program will say, like, you know, your token loses four hit points, my token, you know, gains six hit points, and then those both get written back to the, to the ledger and stuff like that. But that's the extension of what you can do with it. But the thing is that, like, what happens if there's a bug in the way that you calculate how much damage you do to each other? The only way you can do that is you can't upgrade the code because the token is tied to the code. So you instead have to make a system where you upgrade all of the tokens. And again, upgrading all the tokens also requires running a transaction on the blockchain. So that means you have to spend money to move between version one of your game to version two of your game. And all of these sorts of problems keep iterating over themselves. Are there any implementations of anything worthwhile on the smart contracts? Again, the closest thing to anything worthwhile is like using voting to decide where to move money around. But then you're still moving money around that itself is probably hot. So it's like, what, what the, like we have made a way to vote on where we'd like our laundered money to go. Christ almighty. Okay. So let's leave all these tech bros behind and let's talk a bit, a nice bit of communism. I've been doing and releasing the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production Reading Group series. And a, a lot of the discussion in that book is about this idea and the power of, say, a general ledger under communism. Is there anything, do you think, that we can look to the blockchain above and beyond just, say, a random, normal-ass ledger system that would be used in, say, some banking software as is? 